Assalamu alaikum. Let us begin today our next chapter. But before we go into the next chapter, let me quickly recap what we did in the previous lecture. So if you recall, in the previous lecture, we talked about the Gaussian random process. And in the context of the Gaussian random process, uh, we talked about the Wiener Kenshine theorem. Okay, what does this theorem say? It says that the power spectral density GV of F is the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function RV of tau. RV of tau. Or conversely, we can say that the autocorrelation function Rv of tau is the inverse Fourier transform of the power spectral density Gv of f. So that's the Weiner Kenshine theorem, and based on that, we obtain some properties of the uh, power spectral density as well as the autocorrelation function. And then we talked about white noise. Okay, white noise, which has a constant power spectral density. So white noise, it has a power spectral density which is flat. So frequency and GV of F, and it has a naught by two. Okay, so let me write that clearly. I'm just quickly recapping what we did in the previous lecture. Okay, a naught by two, and correspondingly, its autocorrelation function is an impulse. So the autocorrelation function tau with Rv of tau, right? So the power spectral density is an impulse, a delta function of height n naught by 2. So we write it as n naught by 2 delta of tau, okay? And then we talked about filtered noise. So when this white noise when this white noise is passed through a bandpass filter having a certain bandwidth b the noise at the output of that filter is the noise which is present within its bandwidth so filtered noise we also call it as colored noise so filtered noise has a power spectral density which is within a certain bandwidth from minus b to b frequency and for filtered noise we'll use the notation y g y of f and what is the result as a result of, uh, on the autocorrelation function due to the filtering as a result of filtering the autocorrelation function is a sink function which indicates that the noise after filtering becomes correlated, okay? So that's Ry of tau, and the peak value occurs at tau equal to zero, and that peak value is equal to Ry of zero, which is basically the mean squared value, right? Ry of zero. So, as a result of filtering, the noise becomes correlated. Previously, white noise is uncorrelated. That means there is correlation only at tau equal to zero. So at tau equal to zero, there is correlation for any other value of tau. Uh, there is no correlation. But when you filter this noise through some bandpass filter or even a low pass filter, the filtered noise has a correlation which indicates that there is a correlation between the noise samples. And the other thing we noticed, uh, we, we mentioned in the previous lecture is that the noise power of filtered noise, noise power equals n naught b. That means the noise power at the output of the filter depends on the bandwidth of the filter. So if we increase the bandwidth, the noise power will increase because the noise power spectral density is n naught, so that's fixed. So the, the noise power that we see at the output of the filter 
will depend on the bandwidth of the filter. So, if we increase the bandwidth, the noise power also increases. Right. So, that is just a quick recap of our previous lecture. Now, what you are going to do in this lecture is uh, to first study what is called as channel capacity. Channel capacity. So, what do you mean by channel capacity? Channel capacity means what is the maximum rate or speed at which we can transfer information or data across a communication channel. And further, let us quickly uh, recall from chapter 1 reg regarding the transmission bandwidth. So, we did in chapter 1 minimum transmission bandwidth. transmission bandwidth we wrote it as bt should be at least rs by 2 okay so uh, i will get rid of the subscript t here and just write it as b in this case okay so the transmission bandwidth b required is uh, at least rs by 2 where rs is the symbol rate or the number of pulses transmitted per second. We can rewrite this equation in a different way as Rs, the symbol rate should be less than or equal to 2 times B. So, I have just taken this 2 to the other side and written the equation from this direction. So, Rs should be less than or equal to 2 times B. That means, this kind of gives us uh, a way of telling what is the maximum speed at which the symbols can be transmitted over a communication channel which has a bandwidth of b hertz. So, Rs is the symbol rate, the number of symbols transmitted per second should be less than or equal to, that means it should not exceed 2 times the bandwidth of the channel. So, that in a way gives us the maximum speed at which the signal or uh, the data can be transmitted over the channel. Now, if we recall the relationship between the symbol rate Rs and the bit rate Rb, and that is given as Rs is equal to Rb divided by log to the base 2m. So, we can write this uh, relationship, the inequality above, we can substitute in place of Rs as Rb by log 2m and that would mean that Rb by log to the base 2m should not exceed 2 times b, which is twice the bandwidth of the channel, or equivalently Rb, the bit rate is having an upper limit, that means it should not exceed 2 times b log to the base 2 so, that is the bit rate that you can have uh, on a communication channel having a bandwidth of B hertz. And what is M? M is the MRE transmission uh, scheme that we choose. The value of M depends, uh, uh, that indicates how many bits are represented by each pulse. So, how do we choose this value of M? So, that is the next question. How do we choose or what governs the value of M? Okay, so that relationship or the speed at which we can communicate is given by a theorem called as the Shannon Hartley theorem or the channel capacity theorem. Shannon Hartley theorem. What does the Shannon Hartley theorem say? It says that as long as the, or in other words, let me rephrase that a bit. It says that every channel or an additive wide Gaussian noise channel has an upper limit at which you can transmit the information, which we call as the capacity of the channel. 
and as long as your transmission rate is below that upper limit reliable information transfer is possible so that means there is a capacity C capacity C for an AWGN channel capacity which we denoted as C and the theorem says that if the transmission rate RB is kept below this capacity C then communication is possible communication is possible with arbitrarily small probability of error by using some kind of by using some coding technique however if the rate of transmission if the bit rate exceeds this capacity C of the communication channel if RB exceeds C no matter what coding technique is used the error probability will not be small this is uh, if, if I give you an analogy about this it's similar to having a speed limit on a road so for example the, the road has a speed limit of say 100 kilometers per hour and it is not arbitrary you know the, the speed limit has been obtained by engineers based on the design of the road it says that if you drive within the speed limit there is a strong high probability that the chance of accident uh, is very low however if you exceed the speed limit the chance of accident or the probability of having an accident increases right so similarly every uh, communication channel has a certain uh, limit of the speed of transmission which is called its capacity and as long as we transfer information at a rate which is below that capacity so as long as our transmission rate is less than the capacity of the channel we can have communication with very small probability of error of course to achieve that small probability of error we need to use some kind of coding technique which is basically a protection technique to protect our bits however if the speed limit is exceeded that means if the transmission rate or the data rate exceeds the capacity of the channel then no matter what is the coding scheme no matter what protection you are wearing if you drive above the speed limit the chance of accident and therefore injury it becomes too high so similarly if the data is transmitted at a rate above the capacity then no matter what coding technique is used the error probability will not be small okay the the errors will be too too many for the data to be of any use so therefore we need to transmit uh, below the capacity of the channel however uh, we are still research is still ongoing to achieve that upper limit that capacity of the channel or to transmit at the capacity of the channel at the full capacity with small probability of error now how do we determine the value of c what does this capacity depend upon for an additive white gaussian noise channel the capacity c is defined as capacity C is equal to B log to the base 2 1 plus S 
by n. Okay, so the capacity depends on two parameters. The first parameter is the bandwidth of the channel B, and the second parameter is the signal to noise ratio of the channel, that is the signal power divided by the noise power. So, the capacity of a communication channel of an additive wide Gaussian noise channel depends on its bandwidth and secondly on its signal to noise ratio. Uh, again, taking the analogy of a road, the capacity or the speed at which you can drive, the speed limit of the road would depend on the bandwidth means the size of the road or the width of the road and it also depends on uh, the signal power which refers to your the condition of your vehicle and the noise power depends will define the traffic on the road. If the traffic is too high, you have to drive slowly. If the traffic is low, you can drive faster. So, if the noise is too much, you have to reduce the speed of your communication. If the noise is low, you can increase the speed of your communication. So, if you want to transmit faster at, at a higher bit rate, then we need to increase the capacity of the channel and if if we increase the capacity of the channel then we can increase rb because otherwise if rb exceeds the capacity then the error probability will not be small no matter what technique we use so therefore uh, we want to increase the capacity of the channel in order to increase the bit rate that we can uh, transmit over the channel so, what are the options we have to increase the capacity of the channel? The first option is to increase the bandwidth of the channel. The second option is to increase the signal to noise ratio. But the signal to noise ratio can be increased in two ways. One is by increasing the signal power or by decreasing the noise power. So, let us look at both the cases and see what are the pros and cons of doing either of them. So, I will we'll call the first one as, okay, let us say how to increase the capacity, how to increase the capacity of a channel. Of the channel. Okay. So, based on the above equation, uh, one way is to increase the bandwidth of the channel or to increase the signal to noise ratio. So, we can increase the signal to noise ratio. So, in both the cases, we will have the effect of increasing the capacity of the channel. So, let us look at the first case where we try to increase the capacity by increasing the bandwidth and then observe what happens to the signal to noise ratio. So, case 1, case 1. So, when we try to increase the capacity by increasing the bandwidth of the channel, what happens to the noise power? Okay. Increase bandwidth B. So, when we increase the bandwidth of the channel, the noise power N which is N naught B. So, when we increase bandwidth, the noise power increases. So, noise power increases with bandwidth and that is what we discussed in the towards the end of our previous lecture where we said what happens what is the what what is the result of filtering white noise and what is the noise power at the output of the filter as a result of filtering the noise power becomes uh, relative to the bandwidth of the filter so if we increase the bandwidth of the filter then the noise power at the output of the filter is going to increase and for a given signal power, if the noise power increases, that means the signal to noise ratio as a whole is going to decrease. So, when the signal power is fixed, which is on the numerator, and because we have increased the bandwidth and therefore the noise power has increased, 
So the signal power here is fixed, but the noise power and the denominator has increased. Therefore, the ratio as a whole will decrease. So we try to increase the, band, the capacity of the channel by increasing the bandwidth, but increasing the bandwidth has had an effect of decreasing the signal to noise ratio for a given signal power. So whatever increase in capacity we are achieving uh, as a result of increasing B is getting offset uh, by a reduction in the signal to noise ratio because the noise power is increasing. But since the signal to noise ratio is inside the logarithm, the reduction or the compensation effect is not as much as the incremental effect as a result of bandwidth. So it gives us some benefit but not uh, full benefit of increasing the bandwidth. Okay, So increasing the bandwidth of the channel would mean that the noise power increases and that means and therefore and therefore the signal to noise ratio s by n decreases and if s by n decreases that will kind of bring the capacity down so we are trying to increase the capacity by increasing the bandwidth but as a result of increasing the bandwidth the noise power has gone up and therefore the signal to noise ratio has gone down and therefore the capacity is not increasing as much as we expected as a result of increasing B. So it has kind of a compensating effect. Uh, when we try to increase the bandwidth, the noise increases which reduces the signal to noise ratio. The other way to increase the capacity is to increase the signal to noise ratio. So case 2 H2 is increase the signal to noise ratio. So how can we increase the signal to noise ratio? This, this ratio can be increased either by increasing the signal power that is increasing the numerator or by decreasing the denominator which is the noise power. So we can do this in two ways. One is increase signal power. Okay, So this can be done only to a certain extent because if we want to transmit at a higher power that means we need a higher power supply and since most uh, communication devices are powered by a battery the signal power cannot be increased beyond a certain point and the signal power also cannot be increased for other reasons like interference with other users and so on. So the increase in signal power can be done can be done only to a certain extent. Okay. So there are certain limitations of doing this. We cannot increase the signal power uh, as we like. Okay, So we have to take into consideration uh, effects of interference, effects of interference and also uh, battery life. So if we transmit at higher power, that means we are using up the battery more quickly that means the battery life will be reduced so we have to take into consideration the battery life and so on so we cannot simply increase the signal power uh, as we like and the second way in which we can improve the signal to noise ratio is to reduce the noise power reduce noise power Okay. Well, noise is a uh, noise which is external to the system is not in our control. So we cannot reduce the noise power directly, but we can we can control the noise power by enter the uh, communication system itself or to enter the receiver. So the noise power can be reduced by 
can be reduced by reducing the bandwidth. Reducing the bandwidth B. So, when we reduce the bandwidth, then the capacity will decrease. We are trying to reduce the noise power so that we can increase the signal to noise ratio and therefore increase the capacity of the channel. But trying to reduce the noise power by reducing the bandwidth seems counterintuitive because reducing the bandwidth means reducing the capacity of the channel because the bandwidth has a direct relationship with the capacity. So, in order to reduce the noise power, if we reduce the bandwidth, then the capacity will have uh, will undergo a, redu a reduction because the bandwidth has a direct relationship with the capacity. So, it, it is kind of a, a trade-off and a balancing act. So, we need to choose the bandwidth and the signal to noise ratio depending on the uh, limitations and practical constraints that we have at hand. So, by choosing the appropriate value of the bandwidth and an appropriate signal to noise ratio, the, we can have a certain capacity of the channel. So, the capacity of the channel then dictates the maximum speed or bit rate at which we can transmit data over the channel. And what does the Shannon Hartley theorem say? That uh, it says that if your transmission rate or uh, the bit rate RB is below the capacity of the channel, you can devise some coding technique which will make the error probability very small. However, if we exceed the capacity of the channel, then no matter what we do, the error probability of the bits at the receiver side would be too high. So, that is that will make all the received bits uh, basically useless. So, we cannot have it. Okay? So, that is to do with the capacity of the channel. Now, what we are going to do is, uh, we talked about the error probability being small by using some kind of coding technique. right? So, coding techniques are basically methods to detect and correct uh, errors in the received bits uh, when the bits are, have gone through a communication channel. So, this is quite an advanced field at the moment, but I will give you a, a, a introductory flavor to this topic, so that you can have some idea of what the coding schemes are and uh, how do they work and what is the principle behind them. But I will leave it to you to uh, to investigate further if you are interested, but as far as this course is concerned, uh, we will just stick to some very fundamental uh, pr uh, primitive methods of coding. So, we will discuss that very briefly and I will give you some introduction in today's lecture. Right, uh, let us now look at some introduction to channel coding. Oh, see. Channel coding. Okay, what is ch channel coding? Channel coding is uh, sort of a technique or methods that are used to detect and correct errors in the received data. So it has two purposes. The first is to detect errors. and then also to correct the errors. Now, a particular channel coding scheme may be able to detect the errors, it may be able to correct the errors, or it may be able to do both the tasks. It depends on the design of the channel coding scheme. Uh, there are techniques which can only detect the errors, there are techniques which can do both, detect as well as correct the errors, but nonetheless, whatever is the coding technique, it has a certain limitation as to how many errors it can detect and correct. So, it is not possible that a particular coding technique will be able to solve or 
uh, rectify all kinds of errors and any number of errors. So every coding technique will have its own limitations as to how many bits of errors it can detect and how and how many bits of errors it can correct. So the main function of a channel coding scheme is to detect and correct errors obviously within its limitations. So let us first look at uh, some basic form of a technique for detecting errors which, which, which we call as error detection error detection code right the the concept of channel coding is that uh, we add some protection bits some additional bits to protect our data bits for example if you send a parcel through the courier say through FedEx or something uh, you won't just go and give the parcel as it is. You pack it in a box and depending on the value of the material that you're sending, the packaging would be different, right? If it's something more valuable and more delicate, you will put it with a more stronger packaging. And if you have something less valuable and less delicate, you can have a much cheaper and more lightweight packaging. But irrespective of what it is, the courier guy is going to charge you for the entire weight of the package, not just what's inside the box, but the uh, the weight, the, the weight including the packaging, right? So that means putting these extra bits for protection involves a cost in our communication scheme. So we need to have maximum protection with minimum extra bits mid minimum extra weight that we are going to add here so basically uh, whether it's error detection code or error correction code the scheme is going to insert or add some extra bits to the uh, data bits that we want to transmit in order to protect those data bits okay so let's look at some basic form of an error detection code which is called as a parity parity code okay I'll give you an example of uh, parity code and then uh, I will also give you some terminologies an introduction to some definitions with relation to the uh, coding theory or channel coding techniques so first we'll look at what is called as a parity code so a parity code is, uh, is a scheme where to a certain number of uh, information bits, we add some extra bits called as the parity bits, okay? So for example, suppose I want to transmit a bit zero or a bit number one. So this is the data that we want to transmit. And to this data, in order to protect this particular bit, we add say an extra bit which will act as a protection it's like a packaging to protect that bit for example in this case I'm going to add 0 as the extra bit and here I'm also I'm going to add a 1 as an extra bit so in this case um, let me say here so the first bit that is here it represents the data bit the second bit that is here, which is the extra bit that we have added, that's called as the parity bit. And the parity bit has been chosen according to a certain rule in this case. So the rule that we have followed here is that after adding the parity bit, the total number of ones in the, in the entire length of bits is an even number so in this case the first bit is zero I've added an extra bit here which is the parity bit in such a way that the number of ones in this entire code word is is even so we have zero number of ones which is an even number here again the bit information bit that we are transmitting is a one and the parity bit has been added in such a way that the total number of ones is even so such a parity scheme is called as 
even parity. So we call this as uh, even parity scheme. Even parity. Now some definitions. The the bits which represent the information are called the information bits. So in this case, the first bit is the information bit and the second bit which we have here that's called as the parity bit so now for one bit of information we are adding one bit for its protection it's like saying for one kilo of uh, parcel that i want to send i'm making a packaging which is one kilo that means the courier company is going to charge me for two kilos even though my packaging my original content in the box is only one kilos so when the receiver gets that package he's going to open the box and all the packaging is going to be thrown out and what is uh, what what matters to the recipient is only the uh, contents of the box which is only one kilos but the courier company is going to charge you for the entire two kilos of the box that you are sending out so the extra packaging that you're adding is going to cost you. So our objective when we uh, design an error detection or, or an error correction code is to have maximum protection with minimum extra bits that we add. Okay, I will come to that again in a little while, but let's uh, focus a bit more on this uh, concept of uh, event parity. So for for a given information bit or a sequence of bits, we add an extra parity bit such that the total number of ones is even. So in this case, the if you look at the both the code words, the number of ones is in this case zero and here two, so which has both are even numbers. Similarly, we can have a, con the concept of odd parity. So in the case of odd parity, the parity bit is added in such a way that the total number of ones in the code word is odd. For example, if the information bit is zero, the parity bit we have to add here in this case because we want odd number of ones in the entire code word, it should be one. And similarly, if the information bit is one, then the parity bit would be zero because we want odd number of ones in this code word. So the first bit here is the information bit and the second bit is the parity bit. So we have added the parity bit in such a way that the total number of ones in the code word is odd. So the combination of the information bits and the parity bits together, we call it as the code word. So you have the information bit, you have the parity bit, so information bit, the parity bit, so similarly here, these are the information bits, these are the parity bits, and together, together they are called as the code words, right? So, a coding scheme produces code words which contains information bits and parity bits. Now, the next definitions that I'm going to talk about is what is called as the code rate. Code rate. Okay. The code rate determines the or it gives the efficiency of the code. Right? That is or what is the percentage of the total weight that is occupied by the actual contents of the packaging. So out of the total number of bits, how many bits are useful to the receiver, uh, how many bits, con bits con contribute or constitute the information bits. Because the packaging bits, what do you do when you receive a courier? You remove the packaging and throw it in the dustbin. And you keep only the contents which are inside which matter to you. So. The, the, the percentage of the information bits in the entire code word gives us the 
code rate or the efficiency of the coding technique. So the code rate is defined as, again we'll use the letter R, uh, okay, it's the code rate, not the data transmission rate. So the code rate is defined as the ratio of number of information bits by total number of bits in code word right so that ratio so we'll give some notation to that the number of information bits in a given code word will denote that by the letter k and the total number of bits in a code word will denote that by the letter n so the code rate is r equals k by n okay and the code rate is always going to be so r is going to be less than or equal to 1 because the number of information bits is always going to be less than or equal to the number of uh, bits in the code word itself since so we say this is true since k is less than or equal to n so that means the number of information bits is always going to be either less or equal to the number of bits in the entire code word so when k is equal to n that means you have not put any extra bits for the protection so there are no parity bits which have been added at all so that is when the code rate will be equal to 1 so the information bits are transmitted as a, it's like you send your parcel without any packaging directly go and give the parcel uh, to the courier company and send it without any packaging added to it so in a similar way code rate equal to 1 would mean that the number of information bits is equal to the number of uh, bits in the code word. So R equals 1 uh, implies that K is equal to N and that means no coding at all. It means no coding. Right? That means we have not done any error coding at all. Okay? So that's the first definition we have which is the code rate and as a consequence of that we have uh, denoted the number of information bits in a code word by the letter k and the number of uh, bits in the entire code word by the letter n and k is always going to be uh, less than or equal to n okay uh, let's look at another example of the parity code but before i go into that let me uh, let us quickly find the code rates for these two codes that we have done here so what are the code rates here so if you had to do the code rates for these uh, even parity as well as the odd parity codes that we have created here uh, it's the number of information bits divided by the total number of bits in the code word so both these cases the number of information bits is one and the total length of each of the code word is 2 so the code rate is half or in other words the efficiency of coding is 50 percent that means uh, out of the two bits that are transmitted only one of them is the information bit the remaining one is just the packaging bit which is used to protect that information bit so one out of the two bits is the actual useful information for the end user so that means the coding efficiency is 50 percent so you can say the efficiency is 50 percent we want to achieve an efficiency which approaches 100 percent because we want to have as little uh, extra packaging as possible but uh, as much as uh, as much of protection as possible so when we design an error detection or an error correction code or a, or a channel coding scheme the objective is to the 
objective when designing a channel code is to have is to have the code rate approach one that is the efficiency should approach 100 percent but it should also have while having maximum error detection or correction capability so that would be the objective of uh, the code word or the channel coding scheme design okay so that is our focus so to do that let's create another set of even and odd parity codes but uh, with a different code rate in this case so let's do even parity first so let's say we have two information bits now so you can have information bit 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 1 so we can have two bits of information and to these two bits of information we will now add a parity bit a single parity bit such that the parity is even in the sense that the number of ones in the code word should be an even number so for the first one the parity bit since the information bits are 0 0 the parity bit should also be 0 because that would work that is what would make the total number of ones in this code word to be even which is 0 uh, in this case for the second code word which is 0 1 the parity bit should be 1 so when we add the parity bit as 1 the total number of ones the total number of ones becomes even so we have two ones in this case again here the parity bit should be one only then the total number of ones in the code word would be even which is two and for the last information uh, symbol or these two bits uh, since we already have two ones here adding a third one would make the number of ones odd so we have to have the parity bit as zero so that would make the uh, the total number of ones to be even so we end up with a parity code which is of even parity similarly we can create odd parity for two bits of information odd parity so we have two bits of information one zero one one zero one one so with two bits of information we have four possible combinations and the parity bits because we want odd parity so we put a 1 so the number of 1's is odd here we had to put a 0 so the number of 1's is again odd here also we will put a 0 and here we will put a 1 so we put the parity bit in such a way that the total number of 1's is uh, either even or odd depending on whether we want to have even parity or odd parity so uh, let me quickly mark these so these are our information bits and these are the parity bits so for every two information bits we are adding one parity bit so we have two bits of information one bit parity two bits of information one bit parity two information bits one parity bit two information bits one parity bit so in both these cases what is the code rate now so the code rate here code rate for both these codes for both even and odd parity we have r equals k by n k is the number of information bits so the number of information bits is two and the value of n which is the length of each code word is three so each code word is three bits long out of the three bits two bits are information bits 
So the code rate is 2 by 3. That means the coding efficiency. So R equals 2 by 3. So therefore, coding efficiency equals 66.67 percent. So 2 by 3 is 0 0.66. So in terms of percentage, we can say that this coding technique has a coding efficiency of 66.67 percent. So the objective is to have maximum protection while having a coding efficiency or, uh, approaching 100 percent or equivalently the code rate to approach uh, 1. So 2.3 means 0 0.6667 and so on, right? So 66.67 in terms of percentage. Okay, now as I said earlier, the coding technique has its own limitations. It can only detect and correct a certain number of errors or certain types of errors or certain combinations of errors, uh, but not all types of errors, okay? So let's take a look at these uh, parity codes and try to see uh, how, what kind of errors they can detect and when, when do they fail to detect the error, okay? So I'll do it only for the even parity, but the similar argument applies to the odd parity as well. So let's take uh, one of these code words, so let me take the code word say 011. Suppose this is the code word that we are going to transmit and we'll deliberately introduce some errors in that code word and see if the receiver can detect that error or not. So I'm going to use even parity, even parity and I'm going to choose one of the code words. So the code word that I'm going to choose is this particular one, 011 from here. So, so 011. Suppose that's the code word that we transmit. Okay, out of this, the first two are information bits. The last one is the parity bit. And suppose we transmit 011 and we receive 011. There is no error in that, right? How does the receiver know that there is no error in that? The receiver checks it by calculating the number of ones present in the code word and because the transmitter and receiver agreed that their communication scheme would be based on even parity, so it checks whether the total number of ones in the code word is even or not and since it's even, it accepts this as a correct code word. So it says there is no error in that. Okay. Suppose we transmit 011 and there is an error in one of the bits. Say suppose the first bit which was a 0, it became 1 and we receive it as 111. What happens in this case? The receiver knows that the rule that is being followed is event parity but when it counts the number of ones in the code word, it sees that it is three, which is an odd number. So it de therefore detects an error. So it says, no, this is wrong. And therefore detects an error, detects the error. Similarly, instead of the error being in the first bit position, so we introduced an error here in the first bit. But instead of having the error in the first bit, suppose maybe you transmitted 011, but it became 010. So the error here in this case is now in the third bit, which is uh, the 1 has become a 0. Again, the receiver checks the parity count and checks whether it is even or odd. And in this case, since it, the number of ones in the code word is one, which is an odd number, so therefore the uh, the decoder will say this is wrong, and therefore it detects the error. It detects the error, so the error is detected. Or the error can be in the second bit position. So suppose we receive uh, we transmit zero one one but we receive 0, 
0 1 so now the second bit which was a 1 has got changed to a 0 so now the error is in the second bit so the receiver or the decoder at the receiver side would check whether the event parity is satisfied or not and when it looks at it it says that the number of ones is odd but the parity scheme used is even so it detects an error again so the error is detected so and it says it's wrong so it detects the error now in all these three cases it can detect the error but it cannot know where is the error for example if we do not uh, the receiver side does not know what was transmitted it just looks at the bits that have been received and by looking at those bits uh, it can check the parity whether it is even or odd but it cannot identify where the error has happened so how would it know that the error has happened in the first position or the second position or the third position so maybe you transmitted 110 and it became uh, one one sorry zero one one it became a zero one zero or it could have been uh, so basically the decoder side it can detect that there is an error but it cannot detect which position of the bit has got an error whether it is the first bit that is corrupted or whether it is the second bit that is corrupted or whether it's the third bit that is corrupted for example uh, we have a code word here which is 101 which is the correct code word right so when it looks at this code word it cannot know where that the error is in the first place or in the second place maybe the second bit was a zero that got changed to a one so there is no way that the receiver can know whether the error has taken place in the first position or the second position or the third position but nonetheless, in all these three cases, it can detect the error. However, it cannot correct the error because it does not know in which of those three positions the error has occurred. Okay? Uh, it, it does not even know how many errors have occurred. Maybe the information that you transmitted is 0, 0, 0. And all three are having errors and it became 1, 1, 1. So, it can't fix the problem, but it can, anyway, detect that there is some error. Now let us introduce uh, more than one error. Okay, in this case, I'm going to introduce two bit errors. Suppose the we transmit zero one one, but what we receive is uh, let's say the first bit is error, so zero has become one. The second bit is correct as it is. That's one, and the third bit will make the one as a zero so now we have an error in the first bit and also in the third bit so we transmitted zero one one zero one one the first bit which is zero has got changed to a one so that's an error there the second bit is a one the received bit in the second position is also one so there is no error there the third bit is a one that has changed to zero so now there are two errors in this particular code word but when the receiver checks for the parity it counts the number of ones in the code word and finds that the number of ones is even and because we have used even parity it thinks that this code word is correct because the number of ones is an even number and therefore it accepts it as an uh, as a correct code word so which is a wrong decision it is actually not a correct code word that means this scheme has failed to detect these errors so in this particular case what has happened is wrongly accepts as a correct code word Okay, so which is an error. So in general, what we say is uh, a, pari a single bit parity code can detect uh, one bit error. It cannot detect two bit errors 
And similarly, if we introduce three bit errors, so suppose the first bit is zero, we make it one, and the second bit is one, we make it zero, and the third bit is one, we make it zero. So now all three are wrong. In this case, it is able to detect it because the number of ones is odd, but the parity scheme used is even, so therefore it can detect the error here. So one bit errors it can detect, three bit errors it can de detect, but two bit errors it is not able to detect. So that means in general, we say that a, par a parity code, a one bit parity code, so parity code can detect odd number of errors. So if it's a one error or three errors or five errors and so on, it can detect odd number of errors but cannot detect okay but cannot detect even number of errors in the code word okay so i'll stop here for today and we'll continue again in the next lecture where we'll discuss some more details of the code and we'll look at another type of code which will be able to not only detect the error but also be able to correct the error and that is called as a humming code so i'll talk about that in my uh, next lecture okay i'll stop here at this point uh, for today okay guys thank you